Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to our Nuclear Deterrence Forum series. We're really pleased that General Tim Ray can join us today. As the commander of Air Force Global Strike Command and of Air Force's Strategic Air at U.S. Strategic Command, General Ray has a critical responsibility of managing the nation's nuclear deterrence and global strike operations. With a career spanning more than 35 years, General Ray is responsible for two of the three legs of the nation's nuclear triad. And as a result, is at the center of some of the most pressing challenges and decisions facing our nation today. So welcome General Ray, and uh, thanks again for making the time to uh, join us today. I'd like to start off by giving you the opportunity uh, to make opening remarks on the critical challenges that, uh, your team's facing uh, and some of your top priorities as you uh, look into the future. So over to you. Well, always great to be with you, uh, Dave. Thanks for the, uh, the warm welcome and, and the introduction. Um, there's just a lot going on, as you said. You know, I, I won't spend a lot of time on my remarks. Uh, I'll be pretty brief on this. One, I'm very, very pleased with the way the team is performing. You know, we looked at the COVID uh, challenges out there, and you know, I just was out at the ICBM wings. Um, you know, and I I can't tell you how high the morale is. It, it, these folks get their purpose. Um, they're doing a phenomenal job. Uh, they made COVID look easy. Um, the bomber the bomber team is just doing amazing work. Uh, a little bit of a slowdown on the B1. <clears throat> Let's just stop with that team at uh, Ellsworth and Dias, uh, Ellsworth primarily. And, you know, it, it's hard when you're a young aviator. You want to be out there uh, doing the job. Uh, but that whole that whole effort to get us back in the fight is just going really well. Um, I can't say enough about the teammates we have in the material command and the acquisition side of the house. They're doing great work to keep us in the fight. Um, you know, when I look at how we're doing with the modernization efforts, um, you know, I, I'm thoroughly pleased with how we're doing with the, the GVSD, the B-21, the LRSO. Uh, we did have a little bit of a slowdown on the helicopter, as you can see in the budget. Um, some technical challenges with um, paperwork and administrative things, but, you know, nothing that we can't solve. We'll get that thing uh, going here pretty quick. Um, but overall, you know, just incredibly proud of the team, what we're doing right now uh, in the Middle East to, to support the withdrawal, what we've done or doing right now in Europe and what we've been doing in the Pacific. Um, man, it, it's, it's a really fun time to watch your people do great work. And so in the end, this is a people business and I got some amazing people. So I'll just stop there and, and field any questions that you have. Um, well, thanks very much for the uh, context. Uh, General Ray, and uh, thanks again for all your team is uh, doing. Uh, so let's jump into a little bit uh, deeper some of the, the topics that uh, are on folks' minds. Um, in your testimony uh, before the Senate Armed Services Committee last month, you said unequivocally that when it comes to the extension of the service life of the Minuteman III missile, quote, we're out of time, unquote. Could you elaborate a bit on why it's no longer possible to life extend the Minuteman from both the feasibility, effectiveness, and cost perspective? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Dave. When we looked at um, how we got here, 2020, 2010 nuclear posture review, uh, basically presidential policy, said to go and, and look at the affordable way forward on the, on the ground leg of the triad. Uh, so in compliance with policy, we went course of the JROC, uh, the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, they gave us the study criteria for the analysis of alternatives. Those criteria were validated by the, the CAPE, the Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation Team in OSD. And we played multiple scenarios in there. We played uh, different versions of the ground-based. Um, we, pl we played, of course, life extending the Minuteman 3 and a new weapon system. And we had criteria, six criteria, I can't go into all those at this level of classification, but one of the key things was to be able to sustain and operate this thing into the future. Um, every time we looked at this, the, the most cost-effective way forward was not to life extend the Minuteman 3. 
um, the mall, the material decision authority um, has to, or the milestone decision authority in OSD has to certify that this is the most cost effective path forward to go past um, the milestones. And of course, the decision was made back then that life extending the Mid Demand 3 was not going to be the viable path based on multiple, multiple criteria. Um, and features about dealing with the future and features about sustainment really drove some of the thinking. Um, and as we went forward, of course, there was a price differential. The GBSD was slightly less expensive back then in the 2015-16 timeframe. You can look at the congressional reports. Um, we reported again uh, at the request of Congress to go look at that in 2019. The price tag got bigger based on vanishing vendors, uh, more sustainment challenges. Uh, and you know we were on cost on time with the GBSD. And so here we are in 2021. And that, that price tag to life extend the Minute Man 3 gets bigger and bigger. For us to do the propulsion, the guidance, and some of the other um, flight systems, the decision to keep us in the fight was associated with that, that decision to go down the path of GBSD. And so when we chose to do that, back in 2015 and 2016 was when we needed to start new programs to go life extend the Minuteman 3. And, and, and we chose not to do that because of the affordability and the viability. So here we are in 2021 with a phenomenal program in the GBSD. It's doing amazing things uh, on cost, on time, and we're now seeing the, the things that we were worried about now come true in that the vendors aren't there, the parts are really hard to get. Um, you know, and I reported a, an even broader extension of the price tag of that. So as we execute national policy that, that started back in 2010 and we followed US law, we find ourselves here now with, with a great option uh, when we need it uh, very much as a, as a country and the roadmap to, to life extend the Minuteman 3 was back in the 2015-16 timeframe. And that, that means there's a gap if we were to stop and go backwards. Now, let me ask you a bit of a follow-up. In your testimony, you mentioned that uh, the uh, ground-based strategic deterrent would offer about $38 billion in savings over an extension of the Minuteman 3 service life. How does this calculus change for each year that recapitalization is deferred? Uh, to go year by year is hard uh, to draw a line. Um, it was about, I think, you know, different reports back in the 15, 16 timeframe, about one to either 5 billion, depends on how you did the math. It was 20 billion as we reported in the 2019 report to Congress. And it's now 38. And, and I think it really becomes a question of, you know, you could talk about the difference, the question, that really is hurting us is the extensive price tag of trying to modernize or sustain the Miniman 3. You know, we're doing a lot of convoys to go replace parts that weren't really meant to be in the ground this long. So I think that number um, either stays that big or continues. Um, and I think the, uh, the reality of those old parts and, and the lack of people willing to come and repair them or to create new ones is just gonna get worse. Okay, thanks for that. Now, lately, some have called on the Department of Defense to deter, defer, or to cancel plans to recapitalize the ICBM leg of the nuclear triad. Others have suggested it may be possible to do the same mission with only bombers and submarines. Uh, could you explain to our audience what the consequences of this, audience, this option might be, and if they should happen? Uh, both for the Air Force's bomber force and the U.S. nuclear deterrent as a whole. Yeah, Dave, there's two parts there. Let me talk about that first one about what it means to go. Uh, you know, it's a well a well worn path about the responsiveness of the ICBM, the flexibility, visibility of the bomber leg, and certainly the survivability of the submarine. All very interrelated dynamics. And in this this triad is an expression of national policy. And so in the end, you know, I, I, I'm the one that uh, enacts policy and I'm the one that helps, you know, build the capabilities and the options. I don't, I don't set the policy. Um, as the JFAC, uh, as the Joint Force Air Component Commander, 
for strategic command, you know, my ability to do more with the bombers is underwritten by the fact that I have an ICBM like that's that's a risk conversation I have with uh, Admiral Richard about how we'll do things. And, and that's a very straightforward conversation between two four stars who are trying to manage risk. And, and so I, I'm very appreciative of that relationship and the ability to talk to that. Um, this triad lives in the context that we don't get to pick. It lives in the context of a modernized Russian triad with some bells and whistles. This is a triad that lives now in the context of a very, very real and very rapidly growing Chinese triad. Um, and it lives in the minds of our partners and allies uh, who we talk about extended deterrence with. So uh, as we change the, the thinking on our triad, it plays in that context. And, and so, that actually has to, you know, be thought through by other folks besides me. I can just tell them how that works. Um, but for me, as I operate, if I had to go down the path of of a uh, of just a dyad, um, I would need more bombers. I would need more bomber crews. I would need more tankers. I would need to put things on alert. Uh, I would need to be able to disperse and do more things that I can operationally do right now. And, and part of those plans are are underway for that kind of capacity, um, you know, and in the end, I mean, it, it's, it, it would depend on what we would need to hold at risk and how fast. Uh, that would be a conversation that would happen with, of course, you know, the national leadership and, and Admiral Richard and I would talk about how we would do that, but, but there's a bill there that we would have to pay that would, would come at the cost of other things. Now, thank you for that uh, elaboration. Now, earlier this year, you ordered a stand down of the Air Force's uh, uh, B-1 bomber force amid reports of issues with that aircraft's fuel system. Uh, this is the third grounding of the B-1B in recent years. Could you tell us a little more about the current status of the uh, B-1Bs and what does this say about the maintenance challenges that are uh, facing your command? Yeah, Dave, the... Um, um... We're doing, we're doing pretty well for where, what we have to work with in the B-1. We, we're still flying airplanes, just not as many. And we're keeping crews current uh, and a little bit of training. And certainly as we begin to expand capacity, let me, let me give a couple of shout outs. One, uh, our teammates in the program office, both for the bombers and, and for the engines have been awesome, awesome teammates. Um, they've really gone to the mat to get things moving for us. I think we'll start to see additional capacity growing here in the next two or three weeks. And then I think we'll be in a much better place next month. Um, you know, and, and realize I'm working on peacetime criteria. You know, let me, let me be pretty clear. We know when we would break glass and, you know, I've actually got some people who are like, hey boss, put me in, we're fine. And then I've got some some folks I need to you know I need to listen very closely to and and uh, but you know we need to do this safely and smartly and I think we've got that got that line walked pretty carefully but you just need to know there's some there's some folks chomping at the bit and pretty brave about this and and you've got some phenomenal folks in the sustainment world I can't say enough about John Newberry's team uh, and what they're doing to give us the parts so we're really really lucky to have the people in the field and we're lucky to have the people in the program office but we'll be back in the fight here very very soon with that platform now back in february you announced that the air force would decommission 17 of its 62 b1s uh, due to the strain that decades of operation have uh, placed on these aircraft actually strain and demand uh, so what are some of the consequences of this decision for the Air Force writ large, given the pace of ongoing demand? Well, Dave, there's a couple of levels of that. Of course, sir, for the Air Force writ large, I think, you know, you've heard pretty clearly, that like, gosh, we're, we're breaking about 40% more, I think. It takes about 10% longer to fix things. And of course, we're about 30% lighter on, on the experience level. Well, we make it happen um, and the team pulls out some great, great uh, wins, but you know, you know, well, the challenges with these older fleets, the chief has been, been very clear, you know, I think he's got it exactly right. We got to move to the future to be able to be competitive and to find the ways to do things that we need to do. We'll keep fighting the good fight here at the unit level, you know, and, and, you know, I, I can't say enough about how I think how well I think he's thinking through the plan. I think he's got a great way for it. He sees exactly what we need to do. Um, and, and so as we do 
what we need to do as an Air Force, you know, we have to, to manage the here and the now to get to the future. The future for us, for uh, the bombers, of course, the B-21, phenomenal program. You know, I think you just heard uh, in the media uh, high praise from Chairman Smith. And, you know, I, I call that, you know, a tough bar to, to meet. Uh, he's tough on us and he needs to be, you know, this is a serious business and the way we walked him through how we're going to do things with the B-21 really, really resonated with him. Uh, in the short term, it's about, you know, doing as well as we can uh, to keep the parts and things in, in play. We are going to continue and have continued to move the older B-1s uh, off to, to storage. Um, you know, if I had the parts problems, I would really rather solve that on a 45 aircraft fleet than I would a 62 aircraft fleet. Uh, I think we'll be back in the fight. It just means we're gonna have to reshape how we do things to supply it to the combatant commands. We're well on our way to doing that. Um, and I think that just fits with a more light and agile way of doing business, which is so important. You know, we wrote our, our bomber ACE or agile combat employment uh, concept. And we didn't just focus on conflict, we focused on competition as well because all of this has to start with competition and the conflict. And, and what we're doing is we're just, you know, as good airmen do, taking advantage of the situation and writing things the way we think we need to, some great creativity out there. So we'll continue to do the best we can with what we've been given and thinking about how to do the future. No, that's great. A, a bit of an extension of what you just said, the Air Force is facing rising sustainment costs as a result of its rapidly aging fleet of aircraft due to both age and the added wear caused by the pace of global operations. Um, how, how does Global Strike Command balance the rising sustainment cost with those of modernization and acquisition? My gosh, Dave, it's like everybody else out there, right? It's, um, you do the best you can. You, you have the great relationships and you have the conversations you need to have. Um, I'm proudest of a lot of, you know, I'm proud of a lot of things with this command, you know, coming up at the end of three years. Uh, one of the things I'm proudest of is the great relationships we've made with the program office, the acquisition community, industry partners, uh, the test community. We've got a phenomenal relationship there because this is about the business of building air power. You know, there's, there's the tactics and the things that we need to do. But you got to be really good at building air power, and that's done with great relationships. And, and I, I got to tell you, we have them, and we have great people in the field. So we're just going to keep managing these problems as best we can, case by case. Well, thank you for that. I think one of the solutions is what we'll talk about next, and that's the B-21, the requirements of which were developed over a decade ago um, at a time when we really didn't face the kind of threats that we do today. Now, some folks did. Uh, forecast those threats, but Secretary Gates at the time dismissed them, but we are where we are. As we close on the first planned flight of the B-21, could you speak a bit to how the Air Force has incorporated these changes into the development of that aircraft, and can we expect the B-21 to be easily up upgradable uh, to meet uh, the, the changes in the threat environment as we go forward? Yeah, that, I love that question. Uh, we're just out of Palmdale, um, you know, I had a testimony and man, that, they're just doing phenomenal work. Um, going back to your the broader question, there was a lot of thinking that went into this. Um, some former mentors of mine, you know, have really helped me think about this problem. Uh, spent a little bit of time on the acquisition side of the house. I like to joke that it's enough to make you know, my acquisition teammates cringe, but inspire my, my operator friends that actually know what I'm talking about. But, um, you know, it, it, it's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful insight that's allowed me to have good conversations with folks and, and, and they've taught me a lot. Um, you know, and so we look at the B-21 and we look at the GBSD and they're both of the same ilk. Um, you know, there's thinking back a decade ago that said that, you know, what you need is an adaptability capacity. And, you know, I talked with uh, my former boss, Dr. LaPlante about this back when I was a two-star. And we talked about, you know, how we're gonna do the B-21. I said, you know, you can't be five minutes too early taking it from the RCO and you can't be five minutes too late. Um, and you gotta, because you gotta have the, all the dot mil PF things thought through. Let me just tell you, 
Randy Walden and, and our team, you know, between RCO and Global Strength, it's a phenomenal relationship. I look at the, the room and I watch people on the other end. I can't tell which guys are mine or which ones are his because they're just, they're just together. And so there's a lot of really good thinking about how we're going to do this. We've codified now the approach that I think really, really capitalizes on the attributes of open mission systems, modularity and design. And it allows us to keep very stable requirements, modern technology, and then owning the technical baseline so that you're not stuck in a proprietary fashion. We've codified how, how we're going to do this as a team. Uh, we've codified the roadmap for requirements. We've codified the roadmap for the tech research. And we're working to make sure that when you view our capability that you know the Joint uh, Requirements Oversight Council has agreed that we don't need to come back to, to ask for a new radio or a new weapon or a new sensor or new defensive systems. It's part of the bomber. And because of the way we built it and are building it, and in the like I said, the GBSD is very, very similar, um, you can move very quickly. Um, and so because you can move very quickly by adding a new radio or a new weapon, et cetera, um, you know, you don't have to do that before your IOC, right? So, because you can rapidly bring it on. I think it'll take me about a 10th of the time to put the JASM, JASM ER on the B21 than it did the B2, a 10th of the time. And, I, you know, so do you add it now? No, you, you field it on time, on cost, stable requirements. And we've already started populating the block. I, and let me just correct that. We don't do block upgrades unless it's incredibly significant. We do increments and updates. And those can happen like this. They don't take big depot mod lines. You can do it right there on the flight line. You can do it right there at the airplane. And because of that thinking, we know we can move very quickly. We can keep requirements stable. And in the two big you know, challenges to any acquisition system is stable requirements and stable funding. Right, uh, Secretary asked me, why am I not late on the B-21? I refuse to change the requirements because I have no need to. And, and Ms. Warden at, uh, at uh, North says, and I know he's not gonna change them. And uh, so I can focus on finishing the things I need to do. I think deeper conversation is, is coupled with that, I think is what inspired some of the praise that we got from Chairman Smith. Well, that's great news in a, in a, in a subject area that is very, very rarely uh, got great news. So uh, congratulations uh, to you and uh, Randy Walden and, and all the team. Uh, it's great to hear that uh, you're basically interdependent, not interdependent, but uh, inseparable in terms of perspective between the ops and the acquisition folks. I'm switching gears a little bit. We recently saw Air Force B-52 bombers deployed in Europe, Middle East, and Indo-Pacific theaters simultaneously. Uh, now we know our allies and partners uh, don't have bomber forces like we do. And it, it's clear global commitments for bomber presence are increasing. So how is the, this, the reorientation toward pure competition in the past few years affected your operations uh, especially with that truly geriatric B-52 you still fly. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know what to say about the geriatric comment. I mean, at least it is older than me. So, um, no, I, I think we're, we're, in, we're in a very special place as the bomber force. You know, we wrote the book on long range strike. I mean, it, that's why we're an air force. You know, we do this better than anybody else. There's no allied bomber force. There's no allied ICBM force, right? These are cornerstone capabilities. Um, you know, we've, we've done a lot. We, you know, I'm gonna look here at my notes real quick just to make sure that we've tripled the number of, uh, of these deployments, these small brief deployments um, from basically 18 to 20. And then this year we're about a 50% higher. Um, Gosh, from what we've done, you know, it's a fourfold increase from, you know, 21 from 19. Um, and, you know, I think that there's a, there's a sweet spot. Uh, we stepped in to go meet some, some demand. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, I was bragging on the team earlier with COVID, a lot of people slowed down. We got better. 
let me say that again, in COVID, we got better. We had, we had the best bomber air crew readiness in the history of the command in the middle of COVID. Now the B-1 slowed me down a little bit here recently. Um, you know, the CONUS, the CONUSes uh, are, are good to do. We need to find this right sweet spot there. Um, but the nuclear readiness is, it stayed high. And, and that's really what you asked me to do. So this is what we do. And by being the Joint Force Air Component Commander to Strategic Command, I can have a risk-based conversation uh, with Admiral Richard and I know what I can do. And, and we, this is a pace that we can keep up for a little bit longer that I think we need to kind of slow down just a touch and get a little bit better at what we do. Um, and I think, uh, you know, as we get, you know, as the Joint Force you know, it gets more capacity outside of, you know, out of COVID. I mean, right now we're covering the withdrawal uh, in Afghanistan. And so we're one of multiple over the horizon. We're, we're part of the joint fires solution set there that's covering that and, and they're doing phenomenal work with just a handful of bombers. And so I think um, the morale is high. I think the entire bomber force has really embraced this way of life. Um, you know, they, they, see, they see their value. They see the strategic importance. They see the integration with partners and allies. And they're getting to practice the long range kill chains that we know we, we're gonna have to do under duress. And we can do them from anywhere on the planet and we can do it very quickly. So, you know, this is our stock of trade and the kids are doing a great job with it. No, that's great to hear. As the guy who actually implemented continuous bomber presence in the Pacific back in 2004, my compliments to you on the uh, uh, the deployable bomber forces. I mean, I, I think the, the the bomber task forces is really a great way to go and indicates the flexibility that's inherent in long range, high payload uh, air power. Um, a little bit more on the beat. Go yeah, ahead. I add one thing to that. I mean, I think it's really important for everyone to understand. You know, this business of air power, it, it's never been about perfection or status quo. It, it has always been and will always be about overcoming obstacles and, and, and learning how to do new things. And, you know, when we start talking about, you know, applying long range strike in the current and then the future scenario, it's what we do, right? We handle these parts issues. We handle the problems. We handle the logistics. We handle reshaping how we do things. And, and I, you know, I think you got you should have a lot of confidence in the team you have in the field to go do this. So very proud of my team. So I'll just, I'll stop there. All right. One more on the B-52, T-Ray, that Air Force is progressing with a plan to replace its engines, um, the military engines with commercial engines, which uh, uh, obviously it hopes will reduce fuel burn and maintenance. Uh, given the value of this uh, nearly 70 year old uh, aircraft to US operations, how important is this program to the Air Force's modernization goals? David, it's very important. Um, the, uh, the ability to bring in not only more reliable and efficient engines, but the ability to bring in a digital backbone is also gonna be one of the big deliverables. Um, analog airplane, pieces and parts here, digital, um, but as you know, uh, if I want to be effective at, at electronic attack or rapid modernization, I need to kind of have that digital piece in there. So it, it's, you know, I think at the conservative side, about 20% uh, fuel savings. And it's kind of counterintuitive, but, you know, when you think about your tanker bill, it's not a 20% savings in tankers. It's actually much higher, right? Because it, it's not an even apples to apples comparison. In, uh, in some cases, it, it's almost half the number of tankers. So it depends on the scenario and what we're talking about. But this will be a big help to, to all of us. And, um, you know, I think uh, the poor maintenance guys, you know, trying to hang on to that TF-33 and, and keeping it in, in the game, you know, this will make their life a lot easier as well. Well, that's great to hear. And as you're talking about it, I'm reminded that when I was here at Combat Command, planner and programmer back in uh, 2002, 2003, I made the recommendation to the commander at the time that we re-engine the B-52 for all the reasons that uh, he, you all are doing it today. But that was how many years ago? Uh, but then again, the airplane was only 50 years old, not, not 70. So 
Okay, let's move on to hypersonic missile development. Um, the Air Force is uh, pushing ahead with the development of two hypersonic missiles, the air-launched rapid response weapon and the hypersonic attack cruise missile. What are the unique value these missiles uh, provide relative to current capabilities? Um, and are they both expected to be deployed on the B-52 bomber? Yes, yeah, so you, know, you start talking about bombers, bomber task forces, cruise missiles, um, you know, when you start talking about, you know, how the Navy and the Air Force do ICBMs and SLBMs, because basically an ICBM and an SLBM are hypersonic weapons, they're just ballistic, right? <clears throat> so it, we've been doing this for decades in terms of, you know, the weaponeering and the application of it. So it's something we're, we're really good there. Cruise missiles uh, on a bomber, it's natural, right? So we've proven that time and time again. Um, when you launch it, the profile it follows in either a ballistic or an air breathing cruise missile. Um, connect that to the, you know, the flexibility, the range speed, payload, access, um, and knowing the number and types of targets that we can hold at risk. It, it's, not, it's not the same for everybody. But I think that this hypersonic chapter is very important for us to, to bring both of them in. Um, you know, and I think uh, a few small challenges with the arrow here, I think we're going to do fine with it here next month. Um, you know, talking to, to General Collins, you know, they're being smart about this. Um, we'll get there. This is not a problem that's beyond us. It's, it's just a matter of time. Uh, and it's a natural connection, right? We do, we're, we're practicing now the targeting process of a hypersonic weapon on a bomber now when we do some of these bomber task forces. So um, it's a natural connection. It's what we do. Um, and I think we can do it from anywhere on the planet and we can do it much faster than uh, I think one our would-be adversaries would like to see us do it. Um, we can come from lots of different places and angles and we can get there fast. You know, uh, Gus Costella, you know, gave us a cold call one morning on a Monday, you know, and 51 hours later, I had bombers landing in his backyard, a cold call. So this is what we do. Um, and I think this is a tremendous capability for the entire joint force. I know, thanks very much for that. Um, I would also add that you can deploy those weapon systems a hell of a lot quicker and more cost effectively than surface to surface hypersonic missiles that require extensive pre positioned ground infrastructure. Um, so let's go back and talk a little bit about your testimony before the Senate Armed Services Committee last month. Um, during that session, you spoke about the troubling pace of China's efforts to modernize its nuclear arsenal. Um, can you talk a little bit about how China's nuclear modernization fits into China's broader strategic vision? And what does that all mean for how Global Strike Command prioritizes its future ops and capabilities? Yeah. Um Boy, Dave, I tell you, the, the Chinese question is a, is a tough one. Um, you know, I think they're thinking very clearly about the role they play. I think they're thinking very clearly about the regional and the global uh, problem set. I think they're building the arsenal to do that. Um, the pace is breathtaking. I mean, you know, I, I know, and I can't go into the classification here by, by any stretch, but, you know, over the course of time, you know, I would say over the last six months, we started to see changes. It's not that we saw a change, it's the number of times that that assessment fell short of what they actually were accomplishing. And you heard in the testimony how fast they were going. I think, you know, I alluded to, to some of those challenges. I briefed um, several members of Congress uh, at the top secret level about what we're up against. Um, even at the secret level, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty intimidating. Um, and I think they're playing a very smart game. I think they're thinking through, you know, you think through the problem, you have to think about warheads, delivery systems, you have to think about command and control warning, you have to think about, you know, you know how fast and how you feel it. And, and they're getting, they're getting glowing grades at all those things. Um, and, you know, I think the, uh, the pace at which they're thinking about it, the diversity of their approach, 
<clears throat> it, you know, it, it commands the respect of, of how fast they're going. So I think it's something we're going to have to contend with. I think um, clearly they want their sphere of influence. We have a lot of great partners and allies out there that need to know that we're there for them. So. John, thanks for that uh, additional insight. Now we've talked a lot <clears throat> in the past about different platforms, um, but one of the primary objectives of Global Strike Command's 2020 Vision and Beyond document was that of developing capable airmen, which aligns with the objectives that Chief Brown laid out last year. Um, what steps is your command taking to improve unit readiness and capacity? We, we spent some time over the past couple of years really thinking about this and, and we put pen to paper and, and captured what we call striker culture. And there's a lot of great PhD level work. And so if you're into the behavioral sciences, I have 278 pages plus of, 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 of content that will, that will scratch that itch. Um, I also have a smaller version for the rest of us, um, but but it's on four pillars and I think that they're really important. It's on authenticity in our leadership, you know, to be great leaders that inspire trust because that's what you really need, unity and trust in our organizations and we need to build leaders that could do that. We need to find a way to connect each and every airman from every walk of life to that unit, to that installation and to that community. And I think across the board, we're doing a much better job of that. And, you know, I would give a shout out to all of our communities who've embraced that. And that allows the middle two peers, uh, tier um, pillars to be the collaborative environment and the innovation. And the innovative ecosystem that we have is, is pretty phenomenal. We're enjoying uh, many millions of dollars in small business investment. Uh, we're, we're enjoying some venture capital to solving some of the problems. We have a match comm in the unit level relationship. We're tied to AFWorks. Uh, we're tied to industry, we're tied to academia, and, and it's just building a lot of momentum. But I talked as well earlier about those enterprise teammates that we, we, we have built um, that really are paying off and then to have the unit to unit collaboration to be the way we do business because, you know, I mean, that's who we are as airmen, we collaborate. And, uh, and that's really helping us. Um, you know, I think it's very important that we keep a very keen eye on bringing on the talent from every corner of life in this country, the diverse and, and, and very uh, eager talent to know that they can find a place here where unity and trust underwrites how that organization operates and they can, they can contribute like we as a country need them to contribute um, regardless of who they are, where they come from, the color of their skin, where they go to church, et cetera. Um, very proud of that progress we're making. Good conversations are happening. Um, and that's got to be the path. Um, we've taken aim at a few things. Uh, you know, what I would tell you for this and for other things, the suicide rate for us was uh, at 15 of those in 2019. Um, when most of DOD went up in 2020, we, we, we only had eight. So we cut that in half. And I will tell you, um, Dave, you know, I'm not going to, we're going to pace to cut that in half again. And so, you know, there's a lot of folks asking for help and, and to think that, you know, you can go through this business without asking for help is really probably not very healthy. Um, but there's a lot of great things going on and making better. I mean, we just written our paper on data and how we, we want to make that, that what I call a, a revolution in military affairs of data resident here in this command and how we're, we're operating. We're going to go to the cloud. Uh, do a hybrid cloud construct. We have Lauren Canals Martyrs coming out here in a couple of weeks. She's going to spend a week with us. I mean, she's just phenomenal. Um, we're tied with Randy Walden in, in the RCO business, but we're also, that's ABMS. And so everything we're doing with the B21 is integral to ABMS and vice versa. So a lot of great thinking, a lot of great innovation, and a lot of great uh, work that's happening. I mean, it's just so proud of the team and what, what they've become. Oh, that's great to hear, particularly the uh, reduction in uh, uh, suicides. Uh, so keep up the great work. Um, now, here's one that's really been in the news lately, uh, because we've all witnessed the threats posed by nefarious cyber actors and the damage that they can inflict on critical infrastructure. Um, as your command progresses with the modernization efforts, 
What are you doing to ensure that the systems that are critical to our nation's defense are protected against cyber attack? Yeah, so there's a couple of layers of that. You know, there's the old stuff. You know, we like to, as Admiral Richard talked about, you know, how do you cyber protect something that was built before the internet? That that gets a little easier because, you know, there's not quite the vulnerabilities. Um, you know, our modern systems now, we do have to spend more time working with our teammates in 16th looking at that, um, spending the time and energy. Uh, when you look at the new systems that are coming on, there's there's just tremendous software development, leading edge work being done. I was out at Hill uh, watching the agile software development practices employ, uh, employing Kubernetes or the containerized software development, which is which is as good as you can do. And uh, the red teams tried multiple times to break into that, they can't. So I think we're embracing the new technologies for the development. Uh, you know, we're looking at as we feel the GVSD to make sure we have cyber operators in that conversation, not just in the feeling of it, but in the operating of it. As we the integrated wing operations center, we know the command and control is going to be something we have to fight and preserve. And there's got to be some cyber talent in the middle of that. Um, the other thing we're doing is, as I said, in my previous point is we're going to the cloud. You know, we're going to go uh, we're going to go create that that cloud and we're going to make data you know, one of our, our greatest assets and the people who can manage it. Um, you know, and we talk to industry, if you try to protect the network, it, it, you know, but if you protect your data and you encrypt and you, you do smart things, then a lot is possible. And when I talk about who we need to be as a command at the next level, it's underwritten by, you know, conditions-based maintenance, the analytics, um, the command and control, all that's got to be founded on data. And I think we've got a really good group on that. Well, with that, we've uh, now come to the end of this segment of our uh, discussion. So General Ray, thanks again for your great comments as always and sharing your perspectives on uh, nuclear deterrence and uh, global strike ops. Uh, and it is alert to our listeners, our next edition of our nuclear deterrence and missile defense forum is gonna be held on the 16th of June. Okay, we're now going to open the session to questions from the audience. Um, I think most of you on here are familiar with the routine. If you got a question, use the raise hand function. Uh, and it looks like we've got a lot of them opening up. And what I'll do is I'll turn first to Steve Trimble. Steve, over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, I just had a question on the long range standoff uh, program. We saw $250 million added in the fiscal year 2022 budget. So if, if that is, uh, primarily related to the acceleration of EMD, or if there's uh, the question, is it, is it that, or is there some other uh, sort of driver for that for that increase? And then uh, secondly, is there an opportunity with LRSO to work with the Navy as they start development of their SLICM N uh, program? Yeah, the first question, it just, it, that funding represents our support for the program. And, you know, uh, we did take the marks last year in the recession. Um, and I think that, um, you know, we as a department, you know, are, are putting our money on that program to go make it right and to go get it where it needs to be. Um, you know, we'll continue to work with labs and, and other teammates as needed. Uh, we are not working directly with them on Slickman. Um, we do have good relationships as we start talking about guidance and some of the other components with, with GBSD and and the D5 and, and how that's operating. I think that's probably one of the things we're best at, but um, Navy's pretty good at that business. And uh, we're here to help them if they want us, if they want our help, uh, but to jump in directly with them right now is, is not something we're doing. Thanks, Steve. Let's turn now to John Turpak of Air Force Magazine. Morning, General Ray, good to talk to you again. Um, I was asked, I would like to ask about the uh, the arrow. Uh, there are 12 in the budget. Uh, are all of those going to be used for test or are some of them going to be reserved for operational use? And could you expand a bit about what you expect to happen next month? Yeah, so we're going to flight test next month um, as to the composition of those. I'd have to go back and look at that, you know, but it, it's the beginning of our investment in that program. Where the line between tests and operationals, I don't have that one right now, but we can always come back to you. Okay, if I could try a different one then. Uh, there's a, 
substantial reduction in the uh, Air Force budget for munitions generally. Uh, the Air Force uh, official comment from public affairs is the Air Force is comfortable with where it is on the munitions. Uh, can you tell us about uh, uh, where the money went uh, that was going to go into munitions, or are you comfortable with the uh, the str uh, stiff reductions in, in J JDAM and the other programs? Yeah, I'm comfortable. I mean, the Air Force is thinking about the entire enterprise and not just the now, but the future. So I think that budget is a good budget. It's a good, good uh, expression of where we are. And certainly any additional risk is going to be vocalized by the Air Staff. Thank you. All right. Um, thanks, John. Let's turn to Dan Leon. Hey folks, do you hear me? Great. Uh, so I'm Dan Leone. I'm the editor of the Exchange Monitor. We cover civilian defense nuclear programs in general. Thank you very much for making your morning shorter. I just wanted to ask you, the DOE in its latest, its FY 2022 request, just disclosed that one of their two plutonium pit factories may not come online until five years later than expected. I was wondering whether that might delay the initial operational capability of the GBSD with its W87-1 warheads, and that's assuming the GBSD program goes according to current need. And then related, uh, the GBSD with the W87-0, when might the first flight test for quals be for that weapon pairing? Thanks again. Yeah, let me come back to you. Um, we'll, give, we'll give you a better answer on that last one, but um, right now we're not, I'm not, I'm not immediately concerned about that. I think that's something we're going to fix with the pit production, but <clears throat> I'm not. Uh, I'm not held to that. Do you foresee no delay? Yep. For now, I don't. Um, but you'll make me get into some classified dimensions of this that I'm. I'm going to stay out of. All right. Well, thanks for the indulgence, General. Okay. Let's turn to uh, Valerie and Senna. Hi, um, thank you so much for doing this. I wanted to ask about Gray Wolf. Um, the Air Force decided not to fund Gray Wolf in FY22 due to some delays in getting the aircraft certified by the FAA. Um, the Air Force has broadly pointed to some technical issues that Boeing is experiencing. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what those technical issues are? And um, are you concerned about Gray Wolf falling behind in development when the Hue Hueys are already pretty old? Um, yeah, I, so I, I spent some time talking with Boeing about three weeks ago. And, and you know, I would really characterize these problems as administrative certifications not not terribly technical in nature you know there's a um you know there's it's not very complicated technology and so it's a matter of getting things certified um i'm not concerned i think that this um this this is going to be managed here very soon a lot of those um those certifications are going to happen here in the next six months and i think you know when we come back into this um, we're going to be just fine i don't yeah, you know, like I said, there's things that are very technically difficult to challenge, and then there's things that are administratively a lift. And I realize too that you know this is a uh, you know a, a combined effort with Leonardo, an Italian company, and Boeing. Um, you know, and, and Europe was hit very hard with COVID, right? So there's a lot of things we rely on, both the Boeing team, the FAA as an organization, and uh, the team in in, in Europe. Uh, COVID made that even more difficult. And, you know, so uh, we're going to be okay. Uh, as I said, it's not like we're trying to figure out stealth. It's just a matter of getting the, the FAA to look at what's, what's happened and what they're doing and, and to say that that civilian equivalent, uh, the military version of that meets that criteria. If I could just follow up very quickly on that, you, you kind of touched on a bunch of different things there. So is is this a technical problem that Boeing and Leonardo are having? Is this kind of COVID related? Is this a matter of just getting these tests scheduled? Yeah, it's the it's not a it's not a technology problem to solve, right? It is a, a volume of work of tests being scheduled, of certifications being given. Uh, COVID has delayed that uh, significantly. And so, and naturally, you know, you've got to have, um, 
people comfortable on both sides of, of the conversation between the FAA and, and, and the company and that the military is, is that third partner in there and that we're comfortable. Um, those conversations need to finish. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable that we're gonna solve these, these particular issues here very soon. Thank you. All right, let's uh, turn over to uh, Pat, Pat Host. Hello, sir, Pat Host from Jane's. Hey, I wanna know if you're on board with these palletized munitions tests. Are these legitimate military capabilities to augment long range strike requirements or is the Air Force nibbling around the edges at the problem here? Well, you know, I think you have to be creative to think through options and, and things that will help you, you know, improve your capacity. It's an innovative approach. Um, you know, and I think that there's there's ways that this can be done. Um, you know, what I what I would say is that, you know, you gotta continue to do the learning, uh, optimize your pairing and your thinking about capabilities, kill chains, threats, planning, weapons. You know, all a very good start. So in the end, I think this is indicative of learning. We need to continue to, to add to the to the set of options that we have. Um, one, it certainly keeps our adversaries guessing. Um, and two, it, you know, it could give us some capabilities and scenarios that we really need some more help. Um, is the cost curve uh, to using JASM ERs for palletized munitions, is the cost curve acceptable to you? I, I think, you know, I go back to, I think the, you want to get to a place where you have the right weapon pairing, um, planning capabilities and thinking about the threats. Um, you know, I don't think the, the long-term plan should be JASM. I mean, it's just my opinion um, based on how we do that and, and what it takes, um, you know, and how we employ that. I think that uh, the concept needs to continue um, but I would not be satisfied with stopping with JASM as the, the right weapon based on, you know, what you want to really get done there. It's not just price point. It's, it's you know, um, a lot more operational factors that need to be brought into the conversation. Thank you. Okay, let's turn to uh, Russ Mathers. Good morning, General. Um, Russ Mathers from the Cyber Innovation Center. As you move uh, the command to the cloud, data analytics and digital models, how, how do you change the culture of the command? Uh, a lot of those members don't have experience with those tools. How do you get them to, to learn how to use those tools and embrace those tools uh, at full speed? Well, I think you have to have the training. You have to have the, the right layered approach. You can't do an all or nothing there, Russ. You gotta find the areas that you got to start with, they have to be done that way. Um, you know, things that I think that really lend themselves to it much more naturally from a data standpoint is the maintenance and sustainment piece. I think Eric Froelich, General Eric Froelich done some phenomenal work leveraging data. Um, I think the, the readiness ecosystem, right? The ability to model all those things. We're swimming in data now. It's a matter of finding those couple of use cases that will let us learn exactly what that looks like and learn exactly how to do that. Um, and I think we've got some good teammates out there in, you know, in, in the air staff uh, team, uh, Ms. Vadreen and, and Ms. Knausenbarger, who are really willing to come out and help us do that. But it becomes a, a set of, of transitions, right? So, um, you know, revolution in military affairs means that you do things differently. Uh, and the example I like to make is, you know, if, if, if you're, riding a horse um, and you take uh, an improvement program that gives you a faster horse and a better saddle, your, your logistics don't change, your people don't change, none of that does. How you would fight, you might be able to do your same job a little bit better, but when you bring a motorcycle into the conversation, the game changes. It's different sustainment, different logistics, different people, different training programs, different supply lines, different operational concepts. And I think data has to be viewed in the same way, this isn't about just doing the same old thing we've been doing. This is about finding, you know, the, the capacity to do a lot more. Um, and that's going to take different training. That's going to take, you know, taking people aside and giving them the skills. It's going to take recruiting the right kinds of people who really get that part. Um, you're going to need the coders. You're going to need the, 
You're going to need the software labs. You're going to need the, the server farms. You're going to need those network people. You're going to need um, the data scientists, right? And you're going to need a lot of different folks over time. Um, but, you know, a good, be, a good deal of industry is already there. So it's not like it's uh, inventing something that hasn't been done. Okay, Teresa Hitchings. Hi, sir. Thank you for doing this. Speaking of data, I wanted to ask about um, the nuclear command and control modernization and how that fits into JADC2, what you see as the challenges. I know this is difficult to talk about because of the classification, but but I'm really interested in, in overcoming the challenges of integrating a network that's traditionally been very closed off into a, a larger data construct. Um, and just if you could give some thoughts on how that, what the challenges might be to doing that. Thank you. Yeah, you have to be really careful about what I say there. What, here's what I can tell you is when you look at the uh, advanced or the air battle management system, um, our expression of the joint all domain command and control set of requirements. And then if you crosswalk those attributes and, and things in there with the mission needs statement at the top secret level with uh, from STRATCOM on the next generation of, of that, the only difference between those two products is that in certain scenarios, in certain cases, you need a human being in the loop to make the execution decision. Right, so the ability to think about your network, the ability to move data, the ability to encrypt, the ability to do all those things is, is identical. And you know, to go and try to into this really advanced world of technology and telecommunications and space and, 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 and uh, you know, the, uh, the digital world, this, to build a standalone unique system is, it's really kind of an expensive, um, difficult thing to do. Um, that's actually going to be resilient and survivable uh, because it stands, you know, as a unique thing and it can be the target. But this is about moving and dominating the flow of data. Uh, I know what my data looks like. I know how fast I need my data. Uh, I know how uh, how much the volume of the data. Um, and so when you begin to really understand those things, then it becomes a lot simpler. And so what I need uh, to do my job isn't the same that, uh, let's say one of my uh, F-22 teammates would need. He would need you know, incredible accuracy. He would need zero latency. He would need you know, different things. And so as I think about my data requirements to communicate to command and control, to see sense, then, then I can manage what I need inside of that. I hope that makes sense, but it, it makes perfect sense to me. Um, it, it's because the world of communications and data is so much more advanced than it, what it used to be and how we operate. Um, the idea of recreating a standalone unique system that I was completely relied on, on actually becomes a vulnerability and a liability. Thank you. That that makes uh, it makes sense. I I think it's kind of hard to parse out, but I guess my question with the connectivity would be to you. What about cybersecurity? Wouldn't is there a risk that you become more vulnerable by becoming part of this larger ecosystem? I think when you understand the nuclear command and control process, the checks and balances. The, you know, the way we, we do validate that the message is authentic and you know, how that happens, you can see that it would be very difficult um, you know, if we don't do the checks and balances the way we do it, um, you know, it, it's a different story. So, um, and again, it's hard when you don't understand exactly how that works, but it's, it's secret and, and sensitive for a reason because we don't want people to understand, you know, exactly how it works. But, you know, when I look at it, um, you know, I've been at this business for a long time. I'm very comfortable knowing that uh, we understand how to do this and that we can protect it. You know? And I mean, if you have to stop everything or change everything and everything has to be the same from lots of different places 
and that's just not possible. Thank you. Um, General Ray, I, I, we've come to the end of our time frame, but I want to squeeze one more quick one in here from uh, uh, our uh, chat room from uh, Michael Moran, who asked to support long range strike missions against advanced threats. What changes do you see for persistent and timely ISR, particularly from space based systems? How will these ISR capes tie into ABMS efforts? So I come at this um, not from a platform or a domain perspective. And, I, and so let me just say, I think the space dimension is, is very important. Um, but, you know, back in back, gosh, I would say in the 70s and 80s, we had to go find the data um, because it didn't exist, right? We had to go find the thing and, and now, the thing is found. Um, it's it's in it's just in a pile of data, right? It's there from lots of different ways, and so we're swimming in data. It becomes less a question of the platform. It becomes more a question of sorting the data at the rate and speed that's relevant that lets you have the decision authority and superiority, and so. Um, you're going to do that in lots of ways. You're going to do that with lots of sensors. You're going to do that with lots of domains. And, you know, I think the space piece is a really big part of that. I think General Kreider did a phenomenal job uh, creating that data lake, that data library, you know, from space. Um, but now how do we leverage that, you know, as, as a revolution in military affairs, I think is really the heart and soul of it. Well, thanks very much for squeezing in that last one. Um, as I mentioned, we've come to the end of this Aerospace Nation event, and a big thanks to you, General Ray, and also to your team at uh, Global Strike Command. So to you, as well as our audience, and from all of us here at the Mitchell Institute, have a great aerospace power kind of day.